All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I overstayed my welcome on the Facebook chat, it, uh, on the Facebook stream. Unfortunately, I ran out of time, so I'm going to be more careful this time around. Uh, hopefully, we will fit everything in that I meant to fit in. Um, but first, I'm going to give just a few minutes for to see if anybody else joins in, and we'll get started. So I'm going to take a bathroom break. I, I, I had some coffee, and I really, really need to go. But first, more coffee. All right, welcome back. It's 7.02. <laughs> Coffee cake, that would be the, the key word to launch all the nuclear missiles. My apologies. I will avoid saying those words. I wouldn't want something bad to happen. All right. Well, seeing as how I ran out of time last time, I'm going to go ahead and get started now. And um, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So welcome to lesson number four. Today's lesson is about texture temper and form that's it's written right there <laughs> i'm gonna start over let's try that again welcome to today's lesson Hold on. Mm. let me get this i get this right mm. welcome to today's lesson lesson number four in my music uh spring break series we are talking about texture temper and form today so let me tell you what those even mean, right? Texture. You know what texture is, right? You can feel textures, right? Your skin has texture. Your hair has texture. Uh, your clothing has texture. In a musical sense, it is a mixture of high and low sounds and how those sounds are interacting with each other. That is texture, right? We'll talk more about that. Temper is kind of made up. I made it up. Temper has to do with the speed of your music and also the strength of your music, the intensity of your music. So that would be the temper of your music. And then form is how you organize all of those things. You can have sections that are very loud, sections that are very quiet, fast, slow, so on and so forth. So if you organize your music well, you'll be able to create a really cohesive story for your listener. And that's really 
that's really the magic that really makes a song satisfying is whenever that flow of dynamics of volumes and intensities speeds textures whenever all of these things come together we can really create a masterpiece that's that nuance that really really creates a memorable piece of music so we'll get started today with our usual vocal warm-up we're going to take a big deep breath in and then we're going to let that breath out we're going to try and control our breath both in and out to control our voice so take a big deep breath in and let it out see how long you can let it last Hold it. And that should feel good. If you're doing it right, you should be loosening up your shoulders, your chest, your neck and your face. Everything should be loosening up. Try again. Make sure you're filling up that big balloon, filling up all the space with air, and you're controlling it. Breathe in. Hold it and breathe out. Great. You should have loosened up even more than you did the first time. Let's do it for a third time. Breathe in. Hold it and breathe out. There you go. You should be pretty relaxed by now. It just feels good to do that. You can do that anytime you want. Now let's add on our ah sound. We're going to try and make that ah last as long as possible. See if you can beat me. All right, here we go. Breathe in. Hold it. Give you a moment in case your awe is longer. Great. You always want to be light and loose. You want to relax. You don't want to force your voice to do anything. It will gladly do anything that it is capable of doing. Don't force it. Now, to talk about temper just a little bit, let's talk about the volume of our voice. I want to do this exercise again with the ah, but I want you to start very quiet. And then I want you to Build your volume and intensity. And then I want you to bring it back down. Right? Uh, but we're going to do it with the exercise we did before. We're going to elongate that volume change. So go ahead and take a big deep breath in. Hold it. Start down here. Uh, Was that easy for you to do or was that a little difficult? We could obviously make this exercise way more complicated. So if this is easy for you, you can, you can experiment on your own time and make this exercise a little more difficult for you. All right, let's do it again. Let's do it with, ooh, take a big deep breath in. Hold it. Start down here. All right. Hopefully this is at least manageable for you at this point. Again, we can take this to any extreme of uh, uh, fluctuation in volume. <laughs> and last but not least, let's do this with the E eh sound. Take a nice deep breath in. Hold it. 
crescendo is a little bit weak on that one you want to work on making that very very consistent to where you can slowly slowly change your volumes and you can feel every change in volume it's a continuum so it's hard to really quantify how loud you're being but you want to make it as gentle and subtle as possible all right, very good. We've warmed up our voices. We've played a little bit with temper now. Uh, let's go back to uh, let's go back to our uh, hands and our rhythm and our heartbeat. Let's start with a slow heartbeat, something like one, three, four. One, three, four. All right. Now repeat after me. Three and. Do re mi, do re mi, mi re do, mi re do, do re mi, mi re do. Good. Do mi so. Do me do, do me so, so me do, tomb, tomb, tomb. Your turn. Tomb. Tum ti tum. Tum ti tum. Tum ti tum. Good. Rumpity tumpity. Rumpity tumpity. Good. Rumpity tumpity, rumpity tumpity. Great. I'll pause there. So we felt that heartbeat, right? Let's take our speed up just a little bit. So we've gone from a slow speed. We're going to take it up to what we might call like a moderate speed, right? Not uncomfortably slow or fast. Pretty natural. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, and ready. Toom, toom, toom. Toom, toom, ti, toom. Toom, pity, toom, pity, toom. Rumpity, tumpity, toom. Rumpity tumpity toom. Toom ti toom ti toom pity. Toom ti toom ti toom pity. Great. And we'll stop there. All right. We've had a slow speed, we've had a fairly moderate speed. Let's jack it up just a little more, make it a little quicker. Something like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, ready? One, two, ready? Toom, toom, toom. Toomty, toomty, toomty. Toompity, toompity, toompity. Toompity, toompity, toompity. That one's tough, right? Tumpidity, tumpidity, tumpidity. Tumpidity, tumpidity, tumpidity. Tum, tumpty, tum. Tum, tumpty, tum. Tum, tum, tumpty. 
tum 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 ti. Pear pear strawberry. Pear pear strawberry. Apple pear strawberry. Apple pear strawberry. And we'll stop there. Okay, my friends, we have already covered the concept of temper in our music. We've played with our volume, which in music we call dynamics. We've also played with our tempo, which we, uh, our speed, which we call tempo in music. So let me give you some fancy schmancy words for all of these things so that you can sound super smart, super big brain whenever you're talking to somebody one day. Let's start with dynamics. Had to squeeze that one in there. Volume and dynamics are very closely related, but there's a very important distinction to be made. Dynamics has to do with the intensity of sound, how you use your instrument. If your dynamics are high, if your dynamics are strong and intense, you'll be using your instrument in a strong and intense way, right? If I'm playing guitar or if I'm playing a percussion instrument, I'm gonna be just swack, swack, just really, really, really hitting that thing. Or with my guitar, I'll be digging into the strings. This would be a, a high dynamic, which we would call forte. All right, so forte is using your instrument in a very strong way. When we did our volume swell, we got up to a forte volume. Uh, and back down, it's what we would call piano. Piano is a very gentle way of using your voice or your instrument. And fun fact for you, because we're writing the word piano in there, you might be a little confused. You're like, well, that's an instrument. Why would you, is it? So the piano, whenever it was invented, came from the harpsichord and the organ, keyboard instruments. The piano was originally called the piano forte. Do you see a pattern here? What was so amazing about the piano forte was that it could play both soft and loud. That was a technological innovation that drove an entire period of music. The fact that composers were able to play soft and loud on their keyboard instrument meant that they could use volumes to express themselves at will. They didn't have to have two different keyboards, one keyboard for loud and one keyboard for soft. They could just do it when they felt like it. All right, so this is volume and dynamics. The very small distinction that I need you to make is that dynamics has to do with intensity, right? It has to do with how you play the instrument. Volume is just how loud it is. So if I was playing, let's say, Simon and Garfunkel, right? Or a, a folk artist or somebody, and I crank the volume. I'm listening to music that's actually quite peaceful and gentle, but the volume is very high. Do you see where I'm going with this? If I were to take some heavy metal music with blast beats, and I turn the volume all the way down to where I can barely hear it, my volume is low, but the intensity of the music is very, very high. So what I want you to do is make sure to make that distinction. Dynamics is about the intensity of the music itself and how the instruments are being used. Volume is kind of different. If you use the instrument rough, it's probably going to sound loud. But there is an important distinction to be made there. All right. I hope you follow me on that. one. Excellent. Uh, now, aside from volume and dynamics, we've got the speed, that heartbeat that we were doing before, and we were dividing the heartbeat. You can refer back to Tuesday's lesson if you're not sure about that heartbeat. All right, I'm going to go over three different speeds, right? We did a slow speed, we did a moderate kind of comfy speed, and then we did a faster speed. I'm going to show you all three of those. Speed 
in music, we say tempo. Right? Tempo is a very quantized way of thinking about speed. We tie it to beats per minute. So if I was going to play one beat every second, how many beats per minute would I have? Go ahead and chat it. I know you can do this. If I'm going to play one beat every second, how many beats per minute do I have? Oh, come on. I know you can do this. Maybe chat is just slow. Maybe that's what's up. Oh, goodness. I'll give you the answer. Okay. There you go. Yes. 60. So we say 60 beats per minute. All right. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. You know me from my Facebook adventures, yes. So if we have 60 beats per minute, one beat per second, this is a pretty slow tempo. Just think about the second hand on your clock if you still have one of those. That's about how fast you would count your heartbeat. One, two, three, four. That's your heartbeat for that for 60 beats per minute. Right, we're gonna call this walking speed. A musical word for this is andante. All right, so that's like walking speed, right? Let's take an example. Let's think about that that second hand on the clock, right? And let's sing my favorite song, "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star." All right, so if we're thinking about 60 beats per uh, per minute, one beat per second, click, click, click. Are you ready? One, two, ready, and sing. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are above, above the world so high like a diamond in the sky twinkle twinkle Little star, how I wonder what you are. All right, it seems apropos, doesn't it? It's kind of a song that we might use for a gentle melody to sing to a child or maybe going to sleep. And it encompasses this wonder about what is that thing what are all these lights up in the sky right it's a very peaceful feeling on dante this is a very slow speed that generally generally maps to about one beat every second on your on your clock let's pump it up let's double the speed let's take it to what's two times 60 go ahead and chat it i know you can do that One hundred and twenty beats per minute. Two beats every second. We're going to call this Allegro. All right, Allegro is kind of like a bouncy, peppy speed. It's kind of like you've got energy, right? You got mm, just ready to take a little jog maybe. Whereas Andante was about walking speed, not really in a hurry. We're gonna enjoy ourselves. Every single footstep is gonna be enjoyable, right? 
Now we're going to get a little bit of a jog going on, you know? We're not sprinting, but we are jogging along and we're trying to get through it. So let's try two beats every second. I'm going to think about my second hand. Click, 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 click. I need two beats every second. Click, 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 click. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Are you ready? One, two, ready, sing. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Wonderful. So we definitely had a little pep in our song that time, didn't we? We weren't trying to go to sleep and letting our mind wander off, right? We were kind of moving right along. Every note seemed like, well, the next note's coming right up. I don't need to wait that long. Beautiful. And let's move on to our final tempo. I'm going to call this a very fast tempo. This is called Presto. So let's jack it up from 60 to 120, all the way up to 180 beats per minute. I really must get a larger whiteboard. This is, this is getting frustrating. We call this final speed, we'll call it presto. Presto speed, three beats every second. So I'm going to go ahead and think about my second hand. Click, 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 click. I need three beats in there. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Ready? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Right? Not quite apropos for the bedtime story anymore, huh? The whole feeling of our song has changed. All right, any questions so far? We've talked about volumes. We've talked about speeds. We've talked about the very, very special musical words that we can use for these things. You can sound like a super big brain, smart person. Uh, if you drop these words in, hopefully you're not around haters who are gonna like, you know, tell, call you a nerd. Ho hopefully, you know, people appreciate that you're educated in these musical ways. Any questions before we move along? <laughs> yes, music is always better if you are moving to it, if you're dancing to it, just way better all the time. Personally, I'm not much of a dancer, but I do like to move. It's, you know, why not? Okay, these are tools for you to express yourself, the speed of your heartbeats. If you were going above three beats every second, it's going to be pretty uncomfortable. It's going to be the sort of thing where, wow, just sound machine gunned into your face. If you know the Flight of the Bumblebee, very much like Flight of the Bumblebee, that would be our presto speed, right? Now, I don't know if that's a slow heartbeat that has been really finely divided, right? Rumpity tumpity, rumpity tumpity, rumpity tumpity. Or if the heartbeat is just fast. I'm not too sure what the composer meant by that, but it certainly feels to me like a machine gun beat of notes just flying out at you. Okay, moving on. We've talked about speeds. We've talked about uh, dynamics and volumes and intensity of sound. We're going to move right along because I, I lost track time in my Facebook stream and I, I didn't get to talk about form and I really, really did want to talk about form. So I'm going to go ahead and take this down.
Excellent. Let's talk about instruments. Let's talk about texture. We talked about temper already. Temper has to do with how you play your instrument. Is it fast? Is it loud? Is it quiet? Is it slow? All that sort of thing. Texture. Texture is basically, you can break it down as the choice of your instrument. What instrument do you want to hear to explain this particular feeling, this particular emotion or message that you're trying to get across? So we can start with the one that's very, very familiar, the guitar. A stringed instrument that you pluck. But what are the limitations of this instrument? There are a lot of advantages. I can play multiple notes at once. It's very, very easy for me to jump large distances. And I could even play my low sounds and my high sounds together to create almost like a piano-like effect. So these are all excellent things. Oh, not to mention, I don't have to breathe. Uh, I don't have to take a breath, stop and take a breath whenever I play. I can just keep playing notes. All until until I'm done playing notes. I don't ever have to take a breath. So string instruments are very, very cool in that way. But what are my limitations? Anybody think of a limitation on this instrument? I have quite a range here as well. This is an excellent instrument, but it is limited. What's something that I can't do with this instrument? My answer is changing volumes can actually be uh, either problematic or impossible. Once I pluck a note, it's never gonna get louder. It's just gonna fade out. I can't make it louder. There's nothing I can do. I would have to pluck it again. On a violin with a bow, the bow will stay in constant contact with the strings. So in that way, I'm able to change my volumes whenever I'm on a violin or a cello or a bass or anything like that. I could play harder, sure. I could increase my dynamics, go more forte, right? Right? But there's a point where I challenge my instrument to the point where it wasn't meant to be played that way. Once I pluck it, that's it. I get that sound and that's it. I can't make it louder. I can't alter the sound. But with something like a violin where I use the bow, I am able to change my dynamics and change my intensities in the middle of a note because I always stay in contact with the string. All right? So string instruments are great because you can do all these things. You can you can breathe freely as you play. You can play notes just until the cows come home. All this stuff is excellent, great features of the string instrument, but it lacks some things. So these are choices that you get to make whenever you are writing a song. Uh, if you would prefer piano, you can, you can jump distances on the piano quite easily as well. I want to make sure to keep this moving so that I don't run out of time. Okay, so guitar, string instruments, very, very cool. They have their own special thing, right? In terms of texture, they usually can cover a wide variety, a large range of highs and lows. But they generally sound like a string instrument. They belong to that family of instruments, right? And we're talking about texture. We're talking about changing the way that these highs and lows are understood. So let's say we go on to a woodwind instrument. All right, I have here a flute. And flute is one of the most simple woodwind instruments. Of course, this is an orchestral flute. So it's quite complicated compared to what you know might think of as like a native flute or a wooden flute. So I've got my body.
And I have my foot. I'm gonna go ahead and put the foot on. And then I have my head joint. Pretty simple. So we'll put that on there. All right, so woodwinds most decidedly do not sound like string instruments, isn't that right? If you heard a flute, you would know it's a flute and not a guitar, right? I hope so. So there will come a time where you'll decide, nah, this song, this melody that I've written, this maybe it's a wavy melody, this melody that I've written needs a flute. It just needs that because it sounds right, you know, maybe... um. Right, so we get this airy, breathy sound, right? I can power this flute with my air and I can change my volumes, right? So this is one advantage to something like a woodwind instrument. I can change my volumes after the fact. I can very easily get a smooth movement of notes. There's something very, very nice about a woodwind instrument in some cases. Now, I don't have a reed instrument, which is like the larger uh, portion of the woodwind family, but basically the woodwinds, something like a clarinet or an oboe, um, a bassoon, these use little uh, wooden pieces that go onto the mouthpiece that vibrate whenever you blow into them, help to make the sound. You can manipulate that reed with your teeth, your tongue, your lips, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so they just have their own characteristic sound. So there may be a time where you would choose a woodwind over a string instrument just because you need the, the quality, the sound quality of that particular instrument. All right, moving right along. We'll put the flute away. And let's talk about some of these other older instruments like a trumpet. When we talk about a brass instrument, we're usually going to expect to see a mouthpiece. Mouthpieces come in all shape and, shapes and sizes. And the thing about the brass family of instruments is that they actually require a whole lot of work. You could maybe argue that percussion instruments require more work because you have to actually move your whole body in order to play them. Uh, but you've got to do quite a bit of work for these sorts of instruments. What you have to do is create an embouchure for yourself. You have to kind of like work out these very small muscles in your lips. So as a kind of an exercise, I want you to go ahead and find a spot on your lips and start pinching, pinching your lips together until you can maybe get that pinch really, really, really small. You're going to create kind of like a little circle with your lips. You pinch them. And then you're going to make a sound. That's a buzz. And the more you can pinch and the higher you can buzz, the better control you have on your brass instrument. I am not a very good brass instrument player, nor am I a very good woodwind player. These are the basic concepts. So let me see if I can get a couple notes here. Right? I told you I'm not that good at it. All right. Now you saw me doing a bunch of stuff with my fingers. 
on these valves, but I can actually change notes without this extra hand. One of the advantages of brass instruments is that you can change your sound without changing your finger position. So I can maybe I don't have to do a thing. I do it all with my embouchure. So this is another characteristic of another instrument family because you know when you hear a trumpet, now don't you? It's not a guitar, it's not a piano, it's not a flute. There are times when you just need this instrument, maybe for a, a herald of like royalty, right? Or something grand, you know, you need that big fanfare to come through, right? A flute just wouldn't cut it. All right, not to mention these instruments are very loud all by themselves. All right. Difference between volume and dynamics. You can play this trumpet with intensity, or you could play it maybe very quietly and gently, but it's just kind of loud in and of itself. All right, beautiful. Moving on from brass instruments. Percussion instruments. We've talked about strings. We've talked about woodwinds. We've talked about brass. Percussion instruments. You are a percussion instrument. Huh. Right? Ah, good question. Which instrument has the greatest dynamic range? Um, I would say probably the most popular instrument that has the greatest range would be your piano, your keyboard instruments. They generally will cover what? five or six octaves, um, 88 keys divided by 12, something like that. They cover the lowest lows and the highest highs. Yeah, great question, great question. Piano is like the composer's instrument because you have such a range at your disposal and you also have dynamics at your disposal. You can really slam on those keys or you can play them gently. Um, you have the foot pedals that allow the sounds to carry through each other. You can also play as many sounds as you have fingers, not to mention maybe just taking a two by four and just slamming it on the keys. You can play as many sounds as you really want to on the piano. So excellent question. Very good question. Um, awesome. So percussion. Percussion is anything that you hit, shake, or scrape. So potentially everything is an instrument, right? Everything is a percussion instrument to some degree. And that's not even to mention your voice, right? I might put the voice maybe into the woodwind category, but it's not really wood, right? Uh, it's not the brass because it's not a buzz. I don't know. It's kind of hard to categorize, but the voice is a really powerful instrument because I can be as quiet as I want to be. Many instruments have a limitation in how quiet they can be. One thing, though, is that your voice can get tired, right? And it's subject to day-to-day -day influences. I'm hot. I'm sweaty. I'm dehydrated. I can't sing, right? I'm tired. I've got a cold. These are all things to think about. I'm going to go ahead and get onto form because we don't have a whole lot of time. Again, I've squeezed a lot of stuff into this. Oh, my goodness. Yes, stomp. Yes, excellent. They're beating on hubcaps and using brooms, Bic lighters. Yes, very cool. So I'm going to hurry up and get into form so that I don't cut myself off again. Um, think about what would be your favorite instrument mixture? What kind of instruments would you like to hear together? You know, would you like a trumpet and a flute and a guitar to play together? Maybe throw a piano in there instead of the guitar? Think about it. Mixing them up is where you get a lot of the fun and expression out of your music, not to mention the speed, the intensity, the scales you use, the melodies you play up or down. There's so many tools at your disposal that are quite intuitive. All right, form. Most music that you listen to has a specific form. Maybe you can already guess. Maybe you can already guess. Verse. Chorus, verse, chorus, 
bridge chorus famous just like the the paramount way to organize your music verse chorus first chorus bridge chorus so then write that down All right, this is pretty standard. Most any music that you have heard on the radio will follow this format. You have a verse. The song begins. The instruments come down just a little bit. The singer comes in and starts singing about the story or the idea that they have to talk about. You go on for a little while. And then you eventually build yourself up to the chorus. The chorus would be like that really catchy part, that part that... They want you to always remember that portion and come back to listen to their song because their chorus was the catchiest. Maybe it was called the hook, right? The hook that mm, just grabbed you and brought you in, right? So you had the verse. You started off your story. You go to your chorus, the super catchy part that really encompasses the whole idea, right? And then you come back to the verse. You have a little bit more of the story to talk about. So you say more but it's generally the same as the first verse. There's not usually a lot of change. And then you come back to your second chorus, which is an exact repetition of the first chorus. You want that part to be really catchy and really easy to follow along. So you're gonna repeat it like, like exactly, all right? And then at this point, you've said so much of the story, you've told so much of the story, and you've reinforced your basic idea at least twice, and now you need a contrast. You need a new idea to maybe put a different spin on the whole song and uh, hopefully build that interest. You know, maybe there's like a guitar solo in that po portion. Uh, maybe there's a change in scales. Maybe there's a change in keys. Maybe there's a change in instrumentation, right? A guitar solo, right? All of these things that we've talked about today are fair game from section to section. You can have a very quiet verse and then a very loud chorus or vice versa. You can have a very fast verse and then a slow chorus or vice versa, right? So in order to really, really get the most out of your music, you're going to have to organize it and you're going to have to decide how each section should serve the greatest, the greater whole of the song. So I've got a choice for my dynamics and my tempo and my instruments and my scales and my everything in the verse, just as I have all those choices for my chorus and my next verse and my next chorus and then my bridge. The bridge is specifically set aside to just give you that extra little portion to explain more about your story. And then usually you'll come back to your chorus after that bridge to tie it all up with a nice little bow and send them on their way. And hopefully they hit the repeat button and they come back because they want to hear your chorus again. Or maybe your bridge was just killer. So they want to listen to the whole song just so they can get to the bridge. So this is your basic format for writing music. Nothing wrong with this format. It's expected. It's a part of our culture at this point. Nothing wrong with it. You can express yourself perfectly with this organization. But let's make it a little more general. Let's go ahead and just, just uh, give it some alf alphabetical labels. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? I, I sure hope so. All right. I've got a verse. I call that A. And then I have another verse. I'll call that A again. I'll just kind of expect that it's going to be, for the most part, the same. And then I'll have a chorus. Right. I'll label that B. And then I have another chorus, another B, and then another chorus at the end, another B. And my bridge is a C. 
ABBA, right. <laughs> Why not though? You could write a song about ABBA that used A, B, B, A form. Why not? Maybe people wouldn't really get it, but you know, you would get it and that's, you know, hey. All right, so to illustrate this um, further, what I just want you to remember is that each section of music should be serving a purpose. Your verse is telling part of the story. Your chorus is really reinforcing the basic concept, the overarching concept, the general idea. And then your bridge is that little space where you get a chance to expand the story to places that it needs to go, or maybe it doesn't need to go, but you feel like, ah, this would be fun to do anyhow. You have all of the choices that we've talked about today, choices of instruments, choices of dynamics, choices of uh, speeds. All of that stuff is fair game from section to section and even within the section. Why not? You can swell your voice, right? Why can't you swell your instruments? All right, so here's an exercise to talk about form. And we are running running pretty close uh, against the time here. I'm normally logging off about now. So I guess I've, uh, I've bit off more than I can chew with this lesson. Um, okay, let's go back to my favorite song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. And just stop there. That's actually a pretty good stopping point. Don't you think so? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. We're pretty good right there, aren't we? That whole idea seems like it's been tied up. The sentence is done. The melody is done. That's a pretty good place, right? It stands all by itself, really. But we have another section. Up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are i repeated myself didn't i so one more time twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. I've got a pretty solid format here. Start off with a basic idea. Give it a small change. My melody is going down in the B section, right? In my A section, I take a jump. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Mostly going upward. How I wonder what you are. And then I come back down. So you might call that maybe wavy. And then up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. There's a reason that that song is a nursery rhyme, and there's a reason that that song is so catchy, right? It's just so easy to sing. Maybe it's because we were taught it when we were children, but it's also just fundamentally sound in terms of organization and composition. A melody that goes up and then down, and then a downward melody that has a little bit of an angular jump in the middle of it. And then another melody that goes up and down. So why don't you go ahead and take this as homework today? You're gonna take Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and see if you can add a new section. Analyze Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and see if you can fit a C section, a bridge into Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. What, what elements do you have? You've got volume, dynamics. You've got speed and tempo. You've got the direction that your melody goes in. You've got the instruments that you can use. You could change scales, make your twinkle twinkle little star sound menacing and minor maybe. All right, so yes, again, I am running super late 
today. This was a big, big lesson, and I've learned my lesson because this was a lot to fit into one hour. Thank you so much for joining me. Any questions before we log out? All right, so you've got your homework. Excellent. I want you to come up with a bridge section to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and I want you to record it. I want you to upload it, and I want to hear it. Okay, thank you so much for joining me. We covered a lot of information today. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about noise versus music. We have discussed melodies. We have discussed uh, the heartbeat of music and rhythm. We've discussed scales and keys. And today we've discussed form, instruments, and all these tiny little nuances that you can put into your music. Tomorrow we talk about music versus noise. When is it music and when is it noise? I'll have a special guest, Mr. Spencer Vandeveer, to join me. And I hope to see you there. Thank you so much.